they asked us to pee our pants again. So then we went out and they're like, we we did this bit. We peed our pants a second time for and the that camera. didn't make so, the cut of uh, your documentary that they asked to do. <laughs> that's when we thought, oh, may, wait, maybe this will get on the show. You know, yeah. like if, if they're shooting this like post or like wrap up of us peeing our pants again, or maybe they're just pranking us to pee our pants again. I don't know. But well, we did have to walk back to the hotel. Right. You know, we, they got us kind of the, the idea was let's have you walk out dejected. And she goes, and do you think you, she's British? Do you think you could? <laughs> you could uh, uh peter pants again We're like yeah we could go again and so we did and then like that was it that was us walking out and then we just walked straight from there a block to our hotel with piss soaked pants my name is joe pickett and i'm one of the curators of the found footage festival hey this is nick pruer i am the other curator of the found footage fest yes that is the voice of nick and joe of the found footage festival and you've tuned into another episode of Comedy History 101, where we school you in comedy. I am Harmon Leon. Hello. <laughs> I think I oversold that. More like, hello, I'm Harmon Leon. And today we are going to dive into an episode on the history of the Found Footage Festival, most particularly their new documentary, Chop and Steel, which I have seen twice. We're going to talk about their love of collecting VHS tapes and their live show. Their appearance on America's Got Talent that went horribly wrong on purpose. And most particularly, something close to my heart, infiltrating TV shows. Hooray! But before we jump into the episode, a quick plug. I wrote and produced an episode of the podcast 99% Invisible which just dropped this week. The episode is called Devil in the Detail, and it chronicles how police were trained in the 80s and 90s how to spot satanic crimes, which basically were non-existent. So you can check it out wherever you get your fine podcasts. That is, once again, an episode I wrote and produced for 99% Invisible. Also, take some time to like, subscribe, and comment on Comedy History 101, wherever you get your podcasts. Also, on October 13th, Friday night, 7 p.m., at the Red Room, above the KGB bar, in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, I'll be producing my show, Tale, NYC's Finest Storytelling. So come on out for that, and you can find out all this information at Harmon Leon on the social media. And now, without further ado. You stupid. Everybody's so stupid. I'm trying to use the phone. Excuse me. Comedy History 101. What, say, four, five elements makes for a good found footage video? There's a few things. I mean, for one, it has to be unintentionally funny. You know, whatever it was trying to do, it has to uh, have failed at in some kind of interesting way. Uh, that's that's the main criterion. But uh, anything that involves um, a celebrity, we know that's going to be a solid clip. Anything that involves a, a corporate training, that's another thing we love. Rapping in corporate training, that's a yes every single time. <laughs> Um, what, what big the one grill is, skills. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Grill <laughs> skills. Like that's the pinnacle. Um, that's everything. No, but the biggest one I think for us is that we don't take anything from the internet. So like everything that we find for our live shows has to be found physically in hand, uh, in our collection. So I don't know. It just kind of cheapens it. If you just take a link that somebody's passed around a million times. And, and so like we, we take great pride in curating our very own show from our very own collection. Yeah, I think like if you go see our volume 10 show on, on the road, it's all stuff you can't find on the internet, which is even rarer these days. It, I think makes it even more special that it's all stuff that ha- hasn't made the rounds. So and, and we give way too much attention to these videos that, you know, both like like McSee, like the, the McDonald's train video guy, he uh, he had no idea that that even existed. And so but we had watched it a million hours of it. So, yeah, we give we give way too much attention to these videos that just like are in garbage cans. Yeah, I remember we found one at like a thrift store. It was like a home movie 
and it was like this family talent show in their living room. Yes. <laughs> it was yes. like every member did an act and it was like we were just obsessed by it. And yes. it was just like not meant for public viewing. Right. And that's, it's like yeah, again the goal we're looking obsessed for. about the uh backstory of the family. And things so it's like yeah that's I think the best that, part yeah i yeah. think that whole movies you have that whole voyeurism too like I, we, we've sat through the most boring home movies on earth but there's still some sort of voyeuristic pleasure of like seeing this thing that wasn't meant for a public audience so i think that's the one other criteria uh we could mention is that these are things that weren't meant for uh, to be shown on a big screen anywhere our videos were not are not movies they're things like exercise videos, home movies, like you were talking about, Harmon, training videos, and things that are basically meant for an audience of one in a living room. So that, or a break room or something. They're a break room, yeah. So that's why like, it's fun for us to put them in a context they were never intended for. What would be on your all-star dream team? Like if you had to pick like four or so through all the years, through all 10 volumes? Uh, my favorite are these uh, industrial safety videos uh, put out by this insurance company called Federated Mutual. And like whenever they'd have, <laughs> you know, whenever they'd like, uh, you'd be insured by this company, you'd have to watch this video, the safety video, basically about like, don't get hurt. And here are different ways that you can get hurt. So they had all these reenactments of people getting hurt over and over and over again. It's absolutely brilliant. And I got it when I was working at a video duplication house right out right after college. And I, I would always make extra copies for myself. So I like got the entire collection of these videos. And so those, those are always very near and dear to my heart because they're so good. And they're always just so just crowd pleasers. They're just relentless, too. They're like really violent, too. I just I love them so much. It's so, slaps. Uh, yeah. Federated Mutual Insurance would be my number one. I, I think like if we had the Mount Rushmore, it'd be like Federated Mutual Insurance, McSee, the McDonald's training oh, yeah. video. I think uh, the Magical Rainbow Sponge Deep would be running. up there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh well oh and video mate the the video oh, dating yeah. video from 1987 of guys in bad sweaters trying to uh pitch themselves to in potentially interested women that that's another well and you, and you know in volume 10 we we tracked down the guy who created do you know that video dating video yeah Herman, have you seen that before yes. yeah so so uh we tracked down the guy who created it and we had heard a rumor that they had made the women's version of it and uh, I asked him, he's like, yeah, I, I did it, but I never mass distributed. I just have it on a beta tape and it's in my storage locker in Burbank. And huh. I was like, can you get it? And he's like, yeah, I think I'm running down there next week. So maybe I'll grab it. Five years go by and I'm hounding this guy every six months to, <laughs> to bring me this tape. And finally, we got it like three months ago and we're showing it in our new volume 10 show. It's the women's version of video wow. dating. And it's, it's just as good as the men's. <laughs> or just as bad, however you want to look at it. Yeah, and and how 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 has your show evolved over the years? Because again, I, think, I I met you guys yeah. back in San Francisco. I think that now you're volume just, ten. Yeah, it's just that this is our uh, in April will be our twentieth anniversary of the first show we did. So two decades later, I think we've just we've kind of been rewarded for taking things too far, <laughs> you know. So we do that now. There's always a um, not a pressure, but now we have a little few more resources to uh you know like fly down and go meet somebody that we've tracked down or um and the other thing is we've we've even gotten the freedom to insert ourselves more into it i think at the beginning it was very much about the videos but in doing the youtube show and just sort of being like the elder statesman of the vhs community now like we can talk about insert our own uh lives and opinions and personalities a little more um so i think those are things people will see. Um, and, and that's sort of what helped evolve that too, is doing a weekly internet show. Cause now people kind of know our individual personalities we, yeah. and things like that. Yeah. We have 11, I think it's about 11,000 VHS tapes. It's somewhere around there, like no doubles, all 11,000 VHS tapes in our office in, in uh, Golanus, Brooklyn. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm more like, I like the filth and I like the tedium aspect of things. Nick does not like the filth or the tedium. So I kind <laughs> of steer that part of the found footage ship. And then uh, Nick yeah. uh, had, Nick, what's your stuff? Like you well, like, I like, like puppets. I like um, hunks magic. and babes. You like, uh, yeah, hunks you and like babes. The sexu you like the more sexual stuff. 
uh yeah i think most people do actually um <laughs> but uh yeah so like we each have our tastes and we acknowledge that in the show now and um we even have our first non vhs clip in in volume 10 where um you know in addition at thrift stores maybe you did this too Herman, but mm-hmm. like in the 90s we would start finding vhs tapes there and not movies because those were still precious it was the things like uh, beard trimmer instructional tapes and the hair club for men tape they would send you for free and you know and but also um, answering machines were showing up because the digital answering machines were the new thing so the ones with those mini cassettes were at thrift stores and we just pop the tapes out of them and pocket them because they didn't wouldn't even sell the tapes so and we'd listen to them while we were on the road too we just yeah. listen to people's messages the whole time oh wow and, uh, yeah usually they're pretty boring but sometimes you'd get a gem every so often and yeah. uh, we were in Minneapolis. We became pals with this other video collector, but he also collected answering machine tapes. He's like, you have to hear the Dorothy recording. Ooh. And he he had found this one and he he played it for us and our jaws hit the goddamn floor. Like it was just unbelievable. It's three minutes exactly. And it's a candid conversation between two women. And you know, like when you would, you remember answering machine tape days, like you'd pick up the phone late, it would still record your conversation. And it recorded this exactly three minute conversation, and it is a goddamn roller coaster. It's just it's a, it's a woman's it, harrowing experience with diarrhea that's being recounted oh beat by beat to the woman on the other line, and uh, <laughs> and so, but you know, how do you do that visually? Well, Joe uh, basically took a bunch of watermarked images from like Getty and whatever else to tell, tell the, and, yeah, yeah, to help tell the story. Yeah. So we're, it's another thing we're branching off into, you know, other found physical media, finding ways to do that. You're stupid. Everybody's so stupid. Quick footnote before we jump into the next segment. Complete amateur move. I was so ramped up in my conversation with Nick and Joe, and I just love hearing their stories, that I, 15 minutes into the interview, realized I forgot to push record. So, so that first 15 minutes is lost to the ethers. But to bring you up to speed, Nick and Joe have a new documentary out called Chop and Steel that follows their antics posing as fake strongmen who infiltrate morning TV shows and in turn end up getting sued by the media company who owns a series of TV stations that they infiltrated as chop and steel so with that in mind let's get back to the conversation already in progress you're stupid everybody's so stupid the morning news shows is what really set that all in motion yeah and so uh, i i was like oh this is a pretty good story right here and uh, so i called up ben steinbauer and i was like hey we're getting sued right now in federal court do you want to do you want to uh, follow us? And he's like, yes, I'll be right there. So he grabbed the camera. And, and our, our lawyer, you brought up our lawyer before, Anderson. Like, we found him through a friend of a friend. And I, I he was still pretty new at the time. He was still a pretty new lawyer. But then we hit it off right away because this is he's a, he's a former punk rock kid. Like, he, uh, you know, he squatted in a – when he was going to law school, he squatted in a, you know, a house with a bunch of other – punk guys and i remember my first conversation with him he was like you know how like in these punk houses everybody has like a guy named skillet in the house like in these punk rock houses and i was like yeah i think i know what you're talking about and he's like our house had two skillets we had two guys named skillet in our house and this is like our first conversation with him to be our lawyer (laughs) and we're like oh boy is he gonna be a good lawyer uh he roomed with two guys named skillet um but he turned out to be the kind of lawyer we needed yeah Yeah. and again it's like my experience of just infiltrating tv shows is you do the job because you're there to entertain the people watching so like when people watch you guys with the yo-yo champion or chop and steel and then you said there was like one news station when you turned up to uh infiltrate where they just went nah yeah (laughs) <laughs> there was one in, in uh, Eau Claire, Wisconsin. We had two that morning. We had one at like yeah. 5.30 in the morning and one at 6.30 in the morning. And the one at 5.30 a.m., we went in there. And the producer looked at us and he's like, ah, you guys don't really look like strongmen. He just said that to our face. And we dressed in layers so that we looked a little bit bigger <laughs> than we were. And we walked in with a cinder block and a sledgehammer and stuff like that. So we had the props and we you know, made ourselves look bigger than we were. But he's like, you guys don't really look like 
strong men. And we're like, well, we are. So uh, he's like, I'm going to go talk to my producer. And he went back in the back room and then came back. He's like, we're not going to have you guys on. So he he did his homework. I mean, he didn't do his homework, but like he looked at us and, and said no. So good on him. But then we just went across the street to the other station and <laughs> that one that that one went just as well. So yeah. 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 But I think it's again, it's like from infiltrating these places, it's like you're creating entertainment for people. You know, when they turn on in the morning and they go, Do you know what I saw this morning? You know, you're you're that. Yes. So you're doing the job of what they want. Is it yes. create something that people will talk about? And even right. if it's something yeah. false, yeah. they'll still talk about it. <laughs> I, after we did one of them in uh, Allentown, we did one. We went to a Panera afterwards to get breakfast, and somebody was in Panera was just like, "Hey, I loved your uh, appearance this morning." Like somebody had actually watched it. They're like, "It was really, it was really funny." So, like, I don't know. People are laughing while they're watching their channel. How bad can it be? Like, you know, we're we're doing them a favor, if you ask me. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to use the phone. When I infiltrated, like I did things like create police fake arrest reports <laughs> and shit like that. Like this one, it was this show called Lie Detector. Where they oh, I remember up. that. You, sh you yeah. showed that on our show. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Again, I think you've seen all the clips like yes. on, on on your show. So they, they, you know, it was like the ad was like, you know, have you been arrested? Do you want to prove that you've been wronged in a case, you know, to prove something to your parole officer? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like and they go great you're on just send us your police arrest report so i i just like downloaded courtney loves arrest report from smoking gun and mix it with like david crosby's weapon arrest report <laughs> and oh, then find it in photoshop and just sent it off <laughs> and they're okay thanks okay great come we're flying you out <laughs> so That's that i think yeah. I, that might cross a legal line no, I, no, just because it's an entertainment show. I, I don't yeah. know. I'm no lawyer. What do I know? Yeah. But like, I feel like I don't know. It's not like something important. It's some stupid. Uh, well, TV to our, show. our understanding, it's it was the the line is that you can't. Um, you have to put in enough clues, or it has to be some sort of social experiment and have that value to it, where you're trying to expose these companies for not doing their homework, basically. So. That's sort of the litmus test, I think, for some legality purposes. So, but but for what you're doing, like you, you were saying, like even like Jerry Springer and that kind of stuff, they make up the lies for you. you know? Exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, who gives a shit at the end of the day? Your your uh, lie detector one, weren't you like uh, on parole and you smoked pot? And yeah. You, uh, yeah. <laughs> and my favorite part about that is they um they did like a recreation scene, a reenactment scene. <laughs> You know, so they had, they actually had like a, a casting call for like struggling actors to play me and my fake lie in the recreation of the lie that I created and oh. got sealed on the show via my fake police arrest report I created in Photoshop and downloading documents on smoking gun. <laughs> that's that's pretty good. That's I know fantastic. like for for like the fake chef, we did create a like a fake good housekeeping article that the chef did, Chef Keith. It was like how to spruce up your leftovers and it was like uh you know some some dumb uh recipes in there like uh I think it was like sweet potato mushroom uh, sweet, sweet potato bars with marshmallow <laughs> topping or you know things like that and i it had a picture of me in there as a chef and a fake recipe and like we but we wrote the whole article and just kind of photoshopped it and then we just realized we don't need to go that far like we don't need to do fake websites we don't need to do fake good housekeeping articles like with chop and steel there was nothing there was <laughs> just like a press release with verifiable lies in it if anybody did their homework and well i i remember too we uh in college nick and i roomed together in college and we would watch jenny jones every single night at like two in the morning and uh they would be like have have you and your roommate got into a fight yeah. over a girl or something like that so we would always call it up and be like yeah we have and then they would continue to call us i mean we were just like we would make up a story and it looks like i mean we that was down in chicago we were up in northern wisconsin so we never actually made the trip down but we could have and you actually followed through on it so i tip my hat to you on mm -hmm. that yeah and did you do you experience like when i was like doing that a lot like the adrenaline rush would be uncanny yeah. and i sort of like for me i sort of just got addicted to it yes <laughs> like it's just like i just want to 
get on every show and just a hundred percent that the, the thing like i, I turned was... down shows uh, you were sought after yeah yeah <laughs> yeah once you're on the list you know like yeah they would just they wouldn't leave you alone they'd be like okay so you're for sure coming you know and we have you for this other show that might be good as well you know once they find a good subject they want i you feel back. like you were like the dark lord blood of maybe like the stoner guy or something you know mm -hmm. like wasn't that kind of your character on the the lie detector and yeah the, uh, the the what was judge joe brown with the strippers and the yeah yeah uh, again it's just like you're they say what you want what they need like yeah. in like like on a craigslist ad and then you just create something and go yeah yeah i'm that guy and from yeah. their point of view they're just so happy oh man i my homework's done i found that guy well, I don't. Exactly. I don't have to search any you know, more, you know, because I'm just these, a pr yeah. producer assistant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A lot of these producers, especially with the morning news shows, they're right out of college, you know, like because they don't get paid squat. So, uh, you know, they have a lot of inexperienced people. So, like when you know, Chop and Steel, a press release shows up in their inbox, they're like, "Oh yeah, this will eat up ten minutes." Like this is, uh, yeah, you know, we can sit back and relax while they <laughs> do all the heavy lifting here. So, uh, yeah, no, they they. Yeah, they salivate over that. But I've been in a position like that where it's like, yeah, we just want the easier thing. Like even for our BCR party show, we'll have guests on that <laughs> to that will curate clips for us and things like that. And it's like a, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, we gotta have you back on the show to do. Uh, oh, I'd love stuff. to. Yeah, uh, that would be fun. maybe we watch more juiced stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, that was another one where I almost got sued. <laughs> yeah, because uh, you yeah. had to sign a non-disclosure agreement that you're doing a hidden camera prank show with OJ, and the minute we wrapped, I was on the Howard Stern show. <laughs> it's like <laughs> fuck <laughs> these guys. Right. Fuck <laughs> trying to resurrect OJ Simpson as a zany prankster, and then it's like, oh, if they sue me, that's just the OJ trial three. Exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would have been great. That yeah, would have been yeah. a career move, actually. Yeah. yeah, they they never did. Uh, and then, like, probably about a couple months ago, the guy who produced that emailed me and he go, "Oh, we're making a video now of how we regretted making that, and we want you, you know, to come <laughs> on." And it's like, no. <laughs> what? We're making yeah. a video about the regret of the video. Yeah, what do you think we could sell? It would be like Tiger King, and we could sell it to Netflix. And those guys are just, you know, they made like, uh, you know, bum fights and backyard wrestling. Oh, it's those guys. Bags. Yeah, it's yeah, just scumbags, guys. man. That and, and, show was so bad, though. It was so bad. It was so poorly written. It was just, just like... Harassing people. No, it was just premises. It was like, then OJ pops out. There's like no twists or peeing in the pants or anything <laughs> yeah there, there was that one where you just walked into the room and just vomited for no reason at all just yeah. a guy walks in and vomits on the floor well i created that because there's no joke there so i just <laughs> i'm just gonna come in and just throw up and that'll be the at least that will happen <laughs> yeah that's exactly <laughs> oh boy excuse me i sympathize with people like not completely I mean, we're not journalists, but like with, uh, but ultimately it's a pretty victimless crime. Like that's the other yeah. thing is like, what's, what was the crime happening here? We made it, like you said, it's an entertaining segment. Um, I don't think anybody cares whether we were real strong men or not who was watching. It was just like a funny segment on their show and got more attention to their news station than if we would have been real strong men. So you know what was funny is when we were doing uh Kenny Strasser, the yo yo expert, yes. me and Mark went on on one in uh Wausau, Wisconsin, and um he, he did this I, I think his yo yo no 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 he, he he hit himself in the face with like a yo yo or something like that. And then he got really quiet and then the, it was awkward and then they threw to a commercial and then um they were like, they found out that it wasn't a real yo-yo expert. So then they wanted to make amends to their audience. And they're like, we're sorry. We got duped by this guy. We're going to bring on a real yo-yo expert this time. So they brought on this guy. I saw this. Somebody sent me the link. It was like two weeks later. They had on Zami, the yo-yo expert. So they had a real yo-yo expert on. Yeah. And I feel like people who are watching this channel are just like, what the fuck are these people talking? Like, why are we seeing so many yo-yo experts on this channel now? I feel like, I mean, people just like barely even watch these shows, but like this morning news show is like, we have to make amends. We have to give them a real yo-yo. No, we, have... <laughs> <laughs> we have to fill their yo-yo yearning. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And then and Zami, their actual yo-yo expert was arguably more awkward than 
than K stress was. Hundred percent. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Then, then Mark from there, he they, from the yo-yo. Actually, he he got um the office saw him and cast because of the yo-yo. Yeah, yeah. And then so, again, he's gone on to you know what we do in the shadows and yeah, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Wow. No, it was it was like I think we had done seven morning news shows with Kenny Strasser, and then uh, I worked with somebody at the Onion, uh, who was now who was at the office. And they did an investigative report that they included me in. And so she saw me in it. She's like, oh, do, what do you know about this Kenny Strasser yo-yo? And I was like, oh, yeah, that was us. We did that. And so she's like, the office, we've been watching it in the office this whole time. And we want to fly you guys. So they flew us out and we got to meet all the writers and everything. And, and then Mark got on the show. So, yeah. And then from there, yeah, he was on Portlandia, and then he was on, uh, yeah, what we he's on what we do in the shadows now, and he's super funny. So I didn't know that because I think Nick, like a long time ago, you were on uh, a show I used to do at Videology. Um, it was like uh, just uh, I think it was called Video Tale. People tell stories around videos, and then y- you showed that video, and then I didn't make the connection till like years later. That it's wow. Yeah, I think a lot of folks don't know that we did the news things. I mean, it is kind of separate, but I do think like it makes sense when you know that uh, we've sort of like we know what makes awkward television, <laughs> having watched so many videos and training videos and um, and yeah, where we kind of have mined and studied uncomfortable moments captured on video. So it was just uh, a different leap to just do make our own <laughs> awkward moments on video. In the Chop and Steal documentary, the lawyers came back with a settlement that you guys turned down. What was their first, what was that settlement that we, they, we they offered? That's, that's oh, one you, thing that we can't talk about. Ah, is okay, gotcha. Our, our dollar amounts. We can't like- Well, not dollar them. amounts. I mean, I, I think, was it, no, I mean, more like you have to do an apology here or something like that. Was it that sort of, that more on that angle, like the public apology? Was, was it something involving like, or was that the public apology or no they yeah we can talk about that because they they did ask us in their initial thing to read a public statement that said like we learned our lesson that they, that uh, we made a mockery of these hard working journalists and we recognize that their job is difficult and we you know which it isn't it's not a difficult job and we we recognize all these you know and, and it, it, like i think we say this in the documentary but it really felt like uh, something they would uh uh, somebody who had, had you captive would make you read at gunpoint, you know, like uh, being treated well here, you know, it was nothing like uh, our voice or what we would do. And and it just, so I think Joe and I were very clear from the get go. We're not going to acquiesce to their no. it, uh, nobody, demands. Nobody would buy it. Everybody would see right through it. They'd be like, Oh, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're giving up at this point. So, yeah. I mean, it was such a stupid frivolous lawsuit that, yeah, I mean, and then I think at that point too, Vice News was doing a big story about it, and they reached out for comment uh, to Gray Media. So Gray Media knew something was coming, and that they weren't going to look good. And so I think they just kind of caved and were like, "Okay, let's cut our losses and and settle, and we won't make them do this stuff, you know, uh, or we won't ask them to." Because uh, we had some leverage at that point. Finally, the fact that uh, a media outlet was going to cover this and and do a kind of bigger story on it we could finally say like nah we're we're, we're okay not or saying no to your demands and also we got asked to be on america's got talent so like when we're getting sued we're also getting all this press we were so on, because uh, you're getting sued you you got on america's got talent well they asked us to go on and then uh, we got on tosh.0 and we got you know fast company did a story on us so we were getting all this great press and getting all this great attention that was really actually helping our brand and uh yeah that's when i I called up ben i said hey we're gonna go on america's got talent and we're gonna do something when we get on america's got talent like we clearly hadn't learned our lesson at this point but uh and and we were planning on pushing the boundaries too far with this america's got talent thing and we did but i think you did Uh, yeah i think we did so uh (laughs) i mean i'll let you tell it but what were some of your brainstorming processes of how to twist the story once you got on stage what were some other options than the option that you went with? <laughs> or was that uh, always good? It was I always, think, well, yeah. 
I didn't want to do the show because I can't stand right. that show. I'm not a big fan. Yeah, of, was uh, was was the best way to sum up your feeling on the show is when you're watching that Wizard of Oz act on stage, <laughs> and then Nick turns around and looks at the camera with just cold, dead look in his eye. <laughs> it was I've never seen the show. I'd never seen it. I just knew they had. It was like one of the highest rated shows on TV. That's all I knew. And I was like, "Well, I think we should do it." I don't know what we'll do on it, but I. I well, think we I just knew it. that we were going to be like the dumb, like the William Hung character. You know, ah, like so they they the you'd guys. be on, and then a lot of cutaways to the judges like rolling their eyes. Exactly. So <laughs> I was like, the only way I'm doing this is if we go far on this one, we do something really bad. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm. I don't want to spoil it because it's really like. Could, could we spoil it? And then we could, I could just say here. Well, yeah. Let's, I mean, let's spoil I, I, I think it, it doesn't spoil, spoil it. it, but it's like. Uh, well, you still got to see it in order to really appreciate it. Yeah, I think it seeing too, it so. and so, yeah, yeah, let's, fine. let's spoil it. So, so <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I was like, I'm not going to do America's Got Talent unless we go up on stage and pee our pants in front of all of the judges. And, you know, uh, Howie Mandel and Simon Cowell and Tyra Banks, Heidi Klum, uh, one of the Spice Girls. Um, one and, of the uh, Spice Girls. It doesn't matter which one. It, she's just, just known yeah. as one of them. <laughs> that's like, And that's how they announced her. One of the yeah. Spice Girls. And one of the Spice yeah. Girls. <laughs> so, yeah. And so that for was... me, it didn't click, too. Like, I mean, I didn't I couldn't pick quite pictures on there until that was thrown out because, like, I think the only um, and I know like people who've seen the documentary and the story, yeah. it is kind of divisive. Some people are like, I thought that was in poor taste or like you yeah. could have done something smarter. But to me, the only uh, way to combat a really dumb show is with a really dumb act and, uh, you know, and one that they're not expecting and to just sort of like excuse the expression like take the piss out of the, the pomp of this dumb ass show for families by doing something really gross and they really made it easy for us too because like when we got on the show they were like um hey we have your whole thing scripted out we want you to do this from this morning new show's appearance and we want you to so they're writing it for us you know? yeah and we're like oh, and no, were they, no, were no, they no, just is... really the producers really cheesy about it and just yes. like you know yes. and just have fun with it and you know yes, throwing out exactly. phrases like that and... exactly it's like no that's not how we work <laughs> yeah. like, Harman, you've done you, you've done some of this stuff where there's like oh yeah producers <laughs> who like are media coaching you and they're trying to get Basically, yeah, they're writing, they're prescribing exactly what they want you to do. Oh, and, Harmon, uh, you're you're like you're the pro. I yeah. mean, like well, Judge Joe Brown and yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't get on the Springer show, but that was like going to be my pinnacle of like because I had this whole I recruited like friends to be actors and and again like you guys, part of the fun is like overwriting the backstory of the characters <laughs> you know if you oh, might yeah. not even things might not even come up but it might be a line that references back to the backstory which you created but like when 100%. i was in Springer, i made it through like so many hoops with the producer but they were just writing the whole thing and they yep. were like creating fictional elements that weren't true like their line was worse than my line because <laughs> they just wanted to create this fake tension and bring in people that weren't really in the story, but we pretend because the producer wants it and, and things like that. But um, yeah, yeah. So they were they were writing the story well, for you guys uh, when you're on America's Got Talent and you're, you're big font chop. And then it's little font steel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it says again, was there a reasoning like backstory you created for that? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. I mean, I was at a thrift store the day before buying iron ons, and they had big ones and small ones. And I was like, I don't know, like I, I, uh, I just, you know, I was in. Ch I'm, I'm chopping Nick of steel, so I made chop really big. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna make steel little and tiny. You know, like maybe that's the. Uh, well, Joe uh, likes to make me uncomfortable, so <laughs> not that I cared about my font size, but he'll buy a shirt that's way too big, or you know, so I look like I'm drowning in it, or like exactly. You know, I like, like that. I like to <laughs> humiliate Nick yeah, uh, so, publicly uh, as much as possible. I'm glad, you, Harmon, that you you recognize that too. No, Nobody again, ever, it's like all that. these little things, and then they always, you know, when you infiltrate, it ties back to a backstory you might have created. Of like, you know, the reason oh, yeah. why the font well, we, is We small. had whole story. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like we tried to Like if someone asked, about... you know, you would have a whole story planned. Yeah. There's parts <laughs> where like we both grew up on, uh, and even though I was a scummy kid from the wrong side of the tracks and uh, we'll wear big Johnson t-shirts that were hand-me-downs and 
Joe was more of a rich kid. And, like we had these, uh, so that's well, another reason for the font size thing. Is like it, it was know, an was... anti-bullying campaign yes. or something like that. And I'm a former bully, and Nick <laughs> is a, a, a person bully who was person. bullied. Yeah. <laughs> so and it still comes across that way even in the live show. Right. So, so a lot of the stuff is pre-taped. I mean, the, the reason we like doing these morning news shows is because they're live. So you you, yeah. you do these lines and everything. But when you do the pre pre-taped stuff, we kind of knew that this wouldn't get on America's Got Talent after you know, after we peed our pants uh, in front of Heidi Klum. Um, but uh, I think we were on for like a half a second. But mm-hmm. so luckily we we uh, had our own camera there that we set up and had a guy. How, how did you get it in there? Because that was Howie Mandel's uh, comment. It was like, Je- Jedi you know, mind you're not tricks. To... Yeah. It was strictly Jedi mind tricks. Our guy, uh, Priest, our camera guy, just went through and he's like, these aren't the droids you're looking for. And just ah. uh, walked through somehow. I have no idea It wasn't how. like a cell phone camera either. It was, it was like a broadcast camera that he had yeah. to like shoulder mount. And, and so oh, it wow. wasn't like sneaking around. He was in the audience shooting it. And then there was about eight hours of um, uh, interviews and uh, b-roll that we taped uh beforehand i mean it was a full day and we had to pee most of that day um you, you never knew when you were going to go on you know but like, did, so... did did both of you pee yeah we oh both yeah. Peed. I, oh, yeah oh i thought it was just one of you that peed yeah, <laughs> yeah. it was a lot of it was a huge puddle of piss from both of us out there. Yeah. <laughs> it was a pond of piss yeah uh no but like the whole day we had to hold in our pee because like sometimes they'd be like all right we're gonna have you guys go on right now you know and they did that at one point and we had like a bladder full of piss we're like thank god finally and uh then they'd be like oh no we're gonna wait a couple hours so then we we, we had this technique where we would go into the bathrooms and we would let ourselves pee for 15 seconds just to relieve <laughs> the bladder it was a like little a japanese bit. game show you know you're it was like <laughs> endurance or whatever that was it was just yeah uh, uncomfortable uh, at, at one point they were like okay you guys aren't going to go on until five o'clock this evening it was like one o'clock or something so we're like, oh. all right let's just piss let's just like get rid of all of our piss right now let's just like mm. we can be comfortable Build for a while back up and then they were like, oh, wait, nope, we're going to have you guys go out now. We didn't have a bladder full of piss. So we started to panic. And we were like, oh, man. So we just like grabbed as much water as possible and just <laughs> chugged and chugged and chugged and chugged. And then they're like, all right, you guys are up next. And they're like, oh, no, wait, it's going to be 5 o'clock now. So we're like, oh, Jesus uh, Christ. It was just the most stressful day of my goddamn life. <laughs> and uh, what, like, so I think you hear, I mean, it might be Howie Mandela goes, Oh look, they're peeing. Yeah, uh, yep. but it was a what, slow burn. Yeah. What was what was their facial reactions like? The judges, because we, we don't see that in 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 from your well, footage. Well, Carmen, angle. um, uh, uh, I recently I can't say how, but recently got some footage of like the live directed version. Oh wow! It's never aired, and obviously we didn't have access to it. But uh, <laughs> a friend with like an inside source was able to to get some video of like what the live directed version was like and they cut to the audience and people have their mouth their hand over their mouth and, it's like, like it's like the producers like in the moment yes they're, and they do spring time for hitler <laughs> yeah exactly they they have some great audience cutaways they cut to the judges like i think um scary spice has her head down on the table she can't even look and uh simon yeah. powell was horrified so it was kind of funny to see their expressions in close up for the first time. Nobody was mad though, except for the producer who we were working closely with. We came off the the stage and the producer said, uh, mm-hmm. "You guys can't. You got to run that stuff by me. Like, you got to run by like, oh, no, no. pissing into your pants on stage. <laughs> you know, yeah. got to run. Like, that, you got to get that approved by me yeah. first. But you know what's funny is like, a, <laughs> I I think some of the producers thought it was funny or it was just like something they'd never seen before. Because why the they didn't have to clean it up? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that was the part I felt bad about. Is that like that was one thing we didn't even think about. I was like, oh, somebody's gonna have to clean up our piss after we're done. I felt bad about that, but. Um, well, the stagehands were furious. Yeah, they were mad. Good. Yeah, they were like, "What the fuck?" They were like screaming mm-hmm. as they should. And and like, yes, I'm right. mad at us for doing that too. I would be very angry at that too. But mm-hmm. there's one producer who wasn't working with us, but she came up to us and she was like, "She goes, that was brilliant. Let's let's uh let's shoot one more scene where you guys are leaving the studio and you trip and then uh, you start peeing your pants again." So we, they're, they're they asked us to pee our pants again. So then we went out and they're like, we we did this bit. We peed our pants a second time for the cameras. Oh, so, seriously? 
yes, I don't think and that didn't that make the cut of your documentary make... that they no, asked well, to do. <laughs> that's that's when we thought, oh, may, wait, maybe this will get on the show. You know, yeah. like if if they're shooting this like post or like wrap up of us peeing our pants again, or maybe they're just pranking us to pee our pants again. I don't know. But well, we did have to walk back to the hotel, right? You know, we, they got us kind of the, the idea was let's have you walk out dejected. And she goes, and do you think you, she's British? Do you think you could? <laughs> you could uh, uh peter pants again We're like yeah we could go again and so we did and then like that was it that was us walking out and then we just walked straight from there a block to our hotel with piss soaked pants at, so, but at that point it it was barely even piss it was just like it was just water that was just a whole day of drinking water so i don't know if it really counts as piss it was hot like piss but it wasn't piss. It was the like thing that, that really yellow. surprised me is like they booked us because we pranked news outlets like they booked us because we went on and did something that they didn't expect so what did they expect like what did the producer think yeah. was going to happen that we we're going to be their grinder monkey and just do this well exactly as they scripted it i think they always expect that with people on their show it's like cause yeah like, i think they, they think I, just people just happy to be there they yeah. flew us there and yeah. they put us up at a hotel but beyond that it was just like we got these like shitty bologna sandwich it was like prison food during the day and then you couldn't stray and you were just like always wrangled and um you know just like no bottled waters or anything you had to use all like a water fountain or something like that it was just like because they do just have masses amounts of people like you know but yeah it, they made it easy for us to pee our pants yeah. on stage did, like, did, did the other contestants comment like did the wizard of oz cast go man that was uncool or that or that was way to go guys that was <laughs> that, i wish we i had the pariahs. guts to do that <laughs> we got we the pariahs. hell out of there as yeah. soon as possible we, <laughs> we were not that. welcome there well mainly because of the stage hands we thought we'd get punched or something for sure what is the takeaway from that whole journey of chop and steel oh what's the takeaway from that man I don't know. I mean, like we we toyed. We we did another one uh, a, a little while, maybe like a year later. It wasn't with Gray Media. We did another one, and uh, it was just it was a lot of work. And uh, George, we did it in Dallas, Texas. And George H. W. Bush had died that same day. So they're like, "Oh, we're not going live now because we're doing all George Bush uh, memorials and and stuff like that." So uh, we're going to pre-tape your thing. So we did another one and we pre-taped it. And of course they never aired it because it was, it was just ridiculous. And so we don't even, yeah, we, we never even saw that one. Uh, Actually, but, Joe, we should ask for that footage. Cause we had, I that... know I meant to get it when we were yeah. in Austin. Cause I think what, it was, what, was it chop and steal that you did or did you uh, create no, some we did a new character? Oh, what's that character? Yeah. 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 Um, spit painters we uh so we had a video of a guy who is a spit painter so he'd like he had a public access show and he would uh paint and spit on the paint and so then we were like oh we're gonna be spit painters too but we would always just like hack up the loogies you know we'd do the <laughs> and then spit into the paint the other guy was just kind of like spitting like a little bit into the paint while he was painting but i was gonna go just get the flemmy ones up and and i did do that and I think they saw very quickly that it was all <laughs> bullshit. So it never saw the light of day, but we did again. We we snuck in a camera guy who who got the whole thing on camera. Yeah, um, so, it's just it's so sweet when you infiltrate a TV show and it airs. Yes, I know. <laughs> it's Live just like especially. Yeah. Well, the, the 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 part that's like the scariest for me is like forgetting to do a line or something because we do rehearse these extensively and like you said like write the backstory and do all this stuff and it's like whenever i would finish these i'd be like oh dude, we didn't get that one line in and that would just eat at me for so long i'd be like we have to redo it we have to redo it because we didn't get that line in um you know but that's the most stressful part for me and and it also feels like you're robbing a bank but um <laughs> yeah i don't know the takeaway i don't know we we're not doing these uh, we, we did that one and we haven't done anything we're on tour right now um we've been doing something called the two word phrase challenge recently where we go on and i'll whisper two words into nick's ear and he'll have to work it into an interview and uh <laughs> so like the the best example is we were in houston and i uh whispered basketball murderers into his ear and he had to work basketball murderers into the, <laughs> the interview and he knocked it out of the park and so um yeah. It we're, always we're, makes me nervous, but you you know you can somehow find a way. Like that one, it was like the end the end of the interview, and he goes, "So who are the kinds of people who make these videos you find?" And you know the light bulb went off, and it was like, oh, they, they could be crazy. They could be basketball murderers for all we know. You know the videos are, uh, you know, and you just keep talking, and it just kind of 
they they're, they're not listening is real is the real takeaway. And uh, I can't I can't tell if Nick's worked in the two word phrase challenge into this uh, podcast yet or oh, not. But um, yeah, maybe we'll 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 see. <laughs> we still got the podcast left. <laughs> well, I know it when I hear it. Uh, <laughs> it might stick out like a sore thumb, but uh, yeah. And where where can people find you? Find out about your tour schedule and uh, watch the documentary. Yeah, foundfootagefest.com has everything you need. Tour dates, uh, you know, our even links to chop and steal. Yeah. Yeah, chop and steal t-shirts. Oh, we're 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 capitalizing. We're <laughs> we're, we're we're trying to make a buck here. So uh yeah, all that stuff's on there. And we're on uh, we're doing twenty-five uh shows across uh the country and uh Canada this uh and then I think in February we're in the UK. And so uh yeah, all our tour dates are there. Excellent. Thanks so much, you guys. That was just so yeah. fun to hear the stories. Really appreciate it. Yeah, totally. Thanks, Thanks for having me. And that wraps up our episode for today on the history of Chop and Steel and the Found Footage Festival. And once again, quick plug, check out the episode I wrote and produced for the podcast 99% Invisible. The episode is called Devil in the Design. Also, October 13th, come see my show Tale, NYC's finest storytelling at the Red Room above the KGB bar in New York City. Also, take some time to like, subscribe, and comment on Comedy History 101. Even leave a dumb comment. I'll read it. I'll read it right here. For example, here is a comment from someone named Shifra on our history of the Purple Onion. Shifra writes, Sad you say we will get the history of this great old club but you do not give real details, such as when each of these performers played there. Just 50s and 60s. It would be great to have some actual date attached to them. I used to go there and had seen quite a few of them. But dates are really fuzzy for me now that I'm in my early 80s. Thank you, Shifra. Thank you for your comments. Yes, the Purple Onion was an amazing venue. And that does it for our show. Until next time, bye-bye. You're stupid. Everybody's so stupid. I'm trying to use the phone. Excuse me. Comedy History 101.